Happy Halloween! A bit spooky how the Bruins looked as they dominated Cal State LA in their exhibition. Let's go over the spooky stats on this episode of Locked On UCLA. You are Locked On UCLA, your daily podcast on the UCLA Bruins. Part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. Welcome, everybody, to this edition of the Locked On UCLA Podcast. I'm your host, Zach Anderson Yoxheimer. Thanks for making this show your first listen each and every day. It's free where we get your podcast, and it's available on YouTube. Like, comment, subscribe. Thanks for your support. This episode is brought to you by FanDuel, because you can keep the season going or start it big with a big return on FanDuel. New customers, place a $5 bet, and you'll get started with $150 in bonus bets if you win your first $5 bet. Visit FanDuel.com to get started. And where we get started is how UCLA looked on the night of October 30th. And before we get started, how about a round of applause for our Dodgers, who took down the Yankees in five games. Let's go, Dodgers. Whether you're with fans, friends, family, a mixture of all those Friends, lovers, all of it together. Let's go Dodgers. The Bruin and Dave Roberts led them to the title. And if you also were able to keep your attention, you know, multifaceted, you had a subscription on Big Ten Plus, you're also watching the UCLA men's team go after it and take down Cal State LA, a gold, a Cal State LA Golden Eagles team that made it to an NCAA West Regional Tournament last year. UCLA won 100 to 64. 100 to 64. Dominant, yes, but how much can we take away from it? Let's let's look at some key things I wanted to see how UCLA could handle in this Cal State LA game. One, one of the big things was who is the starting lineup going to be? Cronin charted out, Sky Clark, Dylan Andrews, Kobe Johnson, Tyler Bilodeau, all names I've predicted. And if you really followed throughout the spring, throughout the summer, heading into the fall, soon to be winter in a couple of months, we gained that extra hour and everything. Those were the four you'd expect to be on the floor. You had Dylan Andrews, the returning guard. Sky Clark, a scoring guard from Louisville, who Cronin, I think, is very high on. Kobe Johnson, who is probably Cronin's best bud because he plays such good defense. Bilodeau, who scores, and that's what UCLA did not have last year in the four. But continually, they've tried it out. Eric Daly Jr., just like they did in the scrimmage against San Diego State, who started and played close to 24 minutes leaving William Kyle III to come off the bench and play just over 12 and a half minutes in this game. I was very set, and I was convinced that they'd go William Kyle III. Now, Kyle State LA, I believe, does not have a player that's over 6'8", 6'9". That's what you get in D2 ball, right? You don't always get the guys who come in seven foot, who come in ready to play. And that, so they're a smaller team, similar to what UCLA could face in a first-round matchup in the NCAA tournament against some mid-majors, against some teams that run and gun, where their big men is 6'8", 6'9". So UCLA ran with a similar size. The biggest player on the floor was Tyler Bilodeau, and he acted like it. He put in 24 points on 9 of 11 shooting. So I wonder, is William Kyle III just waiting for a bigger, more physical team down low in the paint for him to start? Or is he that off-the-bench weapon that Cronin needs to develop more to earn more playing time, while Daly Jr. maybe a little more, maybe not more seasoned because he's a year younger, grade level-wise, but he can do a little more and guard more positions, while Kyle, I think, is still trying to refine himself offensively. He's not the weapon that Daly Jr. can be both offensively and defensively. Nothing against his game, but against a smaller team, even though Kyle the third is not a seven-footer, you're probably going to go with the more athletic guard-like forward, as Cronin calls the four-spot big guard, you know, three guards, and then a bigger guard with your center or power forward. I guess those thoughts that Bilodeau might be that five, or if Daly Jr. is going to shift in that spot, that's how UCLA is going to look. So the Bruins trotted out that five. Another thing, you look, Trent Perry got a lot of minutes. Dylan Andrews only played 13 and a half minutes in this game. He had two assists and six points. The Bruins are plus 14 was on the floor. Perry got a lot of action, giving Cronin a lot of looks for the freshman point guard. Who are the two freshmen? Looks like he is going to play a lot after his 17, 18 minutes of run time. Now, will Dylan Andrews be playing 13 minutes a game? I don't think so. 
But, hey, if you're going to have your point guard that you're going to ride a lot during the regular season after an extremely tough sophomore campaign when it comes to minutes played, demand, Cronin's probably going to relax what he needs out of Dylan Andrews initially in an exhibition where he can press the freshman into action and see what Perry has with some cross-court skip passes that looked fantastic to eventually lead to a bucket. Perry is the freshman that is going to play, and that is no slide on Eric Freeney. But he is just stuck in a backcourt that is so dominant and so deep that Cronin said after the game, you know, I let the kids decide if they want a red shirt. But, hey, if you're going to get paid for five years playing college hoops as opposed to four, that's not a bad deal. That is certainly not a bad deal. And some of these kids in the most successful teams nowadays, just right before and now post-COVID, have been those senior-laden, veteran-based teams a couple guys in the portal, the guys who have stayed, they're mixed in with the youngster, right? You always need the youth. You always need the experience from your own culture. And then you bring in somebody new, right? It's turning into a more pro-style philosophy in any college, university, organization, how it's going. So UCLA, that's what they're going with. It looks like the freshman is going to get a lot of runtime as the backup point guard to Dylan Andrews. Now, Sebastian Mack played less minutes than Perry as the backup, too. That's because Sky Clark played 27 minutes just about and was red hot. Hit all three of his three, 17 points, was one of four Bruins in double figures. And Sky Clark w- was p- nearly perfect from the field. The only guy who probably was better on the field than Billado and, you know, dare I say, Sky Clark was Kobe Johnson, who again is going to play the most amount of minutes on the court every single night. He got. Six, he had eight points, 11 assists, five steals, and is repeatedly even John Rothstein, a big college football, college basketball analyst, was saying this is a guy that's going to compete for the Naismith Defensive Player of the Year award, just like Cronin was saying. What I've tried to echo apparently, this guy is equivalent to Jalen Clark, and this is his breakout year in blue and gold, trading in those ugly USC colors for the UCLA fours up, getting the eight claps going in Poly Pavilion this year. Much to the dread of that school across town, he can hopefully lead UCLA to new heights and that 12th banner. So what do the Bruins do in this game? They shot 65%. They can shoot a three at a great clip, 53%. They scored 60 points in the paint in a team they could dominate on the interior. The Bruins did because the Daimara was available. When he's there, you can lob it up to him a four times. So he had eight points, five boards, showcasing his new strength. But it's clear there's like an upper eight to nine, and then there's like a back half of the squad that's going to need to redshirt or won't see a lot of playing time. And and those three look like the Freeney, Eric Freeney, Devin Williams. Brandon Williams only played two minutes and 40 seconds. And then you got the preferred walk-on, Christian Ori, who played 14 seconds. And depending on how Adaimara is going, he will get some runtime for sure. The surprise, though, was Dominic Harris playing five and a half minutes, taking one shot, not making it. And you're like, hey, that's the weapon repeatedly Cronin's talked about using over and over. So I was wondering on a a season on the night where UCLA had a bunch of their threes and Harris is not a part of it, what does that mean? Because it's still a crowded backcourt. How are you going to get Harris on the floor if you want an elite defensive stopper in Johnson? To replace Johnson, you put in Stefanovic. You're going to keep Bilodeau on the floor, and to replace him, you know, you could go with multiple options. Andrew's clear replacement is Perry off the bench. Clark's replacement off the bench would be a Sebastian Mack. Where does Harris fit in that rotation? I think Cronin's still trying to figure it out because to play defense, you're going to earn Cronin's heart in minutes over and over and over again. Even if you can only get buckets, UCLA's going to have to be down 15 in a desperate situation as Cronin is trying to figure out ways to manipulate his best scoring five and mold it with his best defensive five, which he will almost always play with in most games before leaning on the best scoring five. That is just where Cronin's going to go. The thing I didn't like, Cal Sidele made a bunch of their threes, including Jaden Lazo, who went 8 of 13 from downtown for 24 points. Cal Sidele hit 52% of their threes. So that means in a scrimmage with numbers, right? One of the San Diego State players, one of the Golden Eagle players, they've allowed one player to get hot from three where all he's doing is knocking down trays, and he's been red hot against the Bruins, whether as a Golden Eagle, whether as an Aztec, 
and the opposition has shot better from three, better than 50% from downtown. All right, those are numbers I do not like so far. Again, UCLA did force a lot of turnovers like I thought, not 24 against San Diego State, only 16 against Cal State LA, and UCLA in this game points off turnovers 22, so they capitalized. They dominated points in the paint. They went out and ran 18 points. The Bruins are only up 16 at the break, but then ran away with it, outscoring Cal State LA by 20 in the second half. So the Bruins can score. Cronin still manipulating lineups. As you can see, one of their best three-point shooting options didn't really even touch the floor. Dylan Andrews played a lot less minutes. Played his freshman year's worth of minutes, right? That's a best day for minutes for Dylan Andrews, who still showed an improved three-point stroke. But what you have to say is Kobe Johnson can do just about everything, arguably better than Jalen Clark did. It's just I think Clark might be a little bit better defender than Johnson. Only time will tell throughout this year. Clark, the real deal when it comes to scoring the basketball. Bilodeau, the mid-range post weapon the Bruins were lacking last season. And then the ongoing shuffle will be how can UCLA handle the paint with the more physical teams in the Big Ten with their big seven-footers. I think they can run with these smaller teams. How can they handle the rebounding, the points in the paints, while battling that with up-tempo pressure Cronin is going to apply this year? All right, still a lot to be learned. I liked how they dominated. You could get really negative, but UCLA never trailed. They led for 39 and a half minutes, and they've been front runners so far. And now we wait for Ryder. November 4th is when the season tips off, and we're excited for UCLA men's basketball. When I'm thinking they should be a third weekend of the tournament team, that's my expectation, how good this team is. That is Big Ten winning, Big Ten tournament winning, at least Sweet 16, Elite 8, get the best of the bounce in March. Madden is good. And I'm thinking the Bruins can do so. There are some things to tinker with. Scoring is there. Now if Cronin can get the score and mix with the best defensive five, this team could be one of the best in the country. But they're looking legitimate as they kick Cal State LA's butt. Now let's play some D1 competition and see what they look like. Next, UCLA football coming off their bye. What do they need to do to beat Nebraska? It will be a battle of the quarterbacks next on Locked on UCLA. Get ready to tackle the NFL action with FanDuel, America's number one sports book. Right now, new customers can bet $5, get 150 in bonus bets if you win. Again, the FanDuel Sportsbook app gives you everything you need to place live bets on the NFL all in one place. And when you get a hunch in the middle of the game, you can check out the latest stats for your live play-by-play -play, and so much more on the same place and in the same page where you place your bets. Just visit FanDuel.com to join today. Again, you'll get started with $150 in bonus bets if you win your first $5 bet. That's FanDuel.com. Never waste a hunch and make every moment more with FanDuel, an official sportsbook partner of the NFL. Cruising on, second segment for the Locked On UCLA podcast. We are shifting back to the gridiron. The Bruins are off the bye week. It's weird in a year where you get two built-in buys, but for now, the Bruins are wanting to use this momentum prior to the bye week and carry it into what could be a very, maybe not favorable back after the schedule, just favorable because it's not the murderer's role that was Indiana at home at LSU, number one Oregon at home. And then at Penn State, who's currently number three in the country. Could be number two by the weekend's end. So a lot of things the Bruins have been waiting to get past the dreaded you know, schedule. But this game will be marked UCLA heading to Lincoln, which is a very tough environment, but maybe just equally or as tough as Penn State's been, as LSU's been. Traveling not as crazy as it was to get to Hawaii and play in the middle of the day in August in a hot, humid, 80-degree day in the middle of the day in Hawaii. So UCLA's faced it all, and they've had their best, best quote-unquote, best performances, meaning wins, on the road. So let's get another one before maybe you can snag one against Iowa on homecoming night. This game will be defined by quarterback play. All right? These are two teams where I think both fan bases are complaining about their OCs, right? Marcus Satters Sattersfield for... Nebraska, Eric Bienmi, of course, for UCLA. 
I think even Dylan Rayola was talking about his OC and Ethan Garbers is, and the whole UCLA offense has been trying to figure out what the enemy has been wanting to do this whole season. And then they put together what was a picturesque performance against a Rutgers defense that was beat up, but still the Bruins came to play and for the most part executed to perfection. These are two quarterbacks that are prone to turn over the football. One, a redshirt senior. The other, a true freshman quarterback that if you go side by side with Patrick Mahomes, everything is the same except you realize one's much older dominating the NFL and Rayola is still a true freshman at Nebraska. Nebraska has done some good things. They had a lot of wins, but they choked the Illinois game. They got dominated in their game at Bloomington against Indiana, just like UCLA did, but at a much worse scoreline. And then they did some good things, were physical against the sleepy Ohio State team coming off a bye and nearly shocked the world by knocking off the Buckeyes in Columbus when they're a huge four-score underdogs. But it wasn't like Rayola really lit up the world, but he is still a young quarterback that can feast on the UCLA secondary if the Bruins' pass rush does not get home. This year, Rayola is completing 66% of his passes, close to 1,800 yards. He has nine touchdowns, seven interceptions, and Rayola has not thrown for a touchdown in the month of October. So for every single game that Nebraska played in the month of October, Rayola did not throw a single touchdown pass. His touchdown to interception rating was actually zero touchdowns to five interceptions, where he's averaging just over 218 yards per game. So this game is going to be about the moxie. Which quarterback is it the veteran or a true freshman who has seen some of the best? He's played now, what, eight games under his belt, where he started off the year with, what, six, looks like eight, ten, ten touchdowns, nine touchdowns to two interceptions, nine touchdowns to two interceptions. And has since thrown five interceptions since his last touchdown pass. So five picks to his last touchdown pass. And has only eclipsed 200 yards once in the last three games. And none have been over 250 yards. Garbers, though, threw for a lot of yards. Has been breaking his career records. Getting more opportunity. Getting healthier. But I'm not going to say I'm here to convince you Garbers won't turn over the football. It's which quarterback turns over the football the least. All right? Which quarterback turns over the football the least? Because Nebraska has proven they can beat teams like Rutgers, where they only scored 14 points, but beat them 14-7, to where they completed 48% of their passes, 134 yards, and a pick. And that's all they needed from Rayola. Now they have a running game that, compared to UCLA's, looks much, much better. Now it's not wor world-beating. They're not going to completely run all over the Bruins, I think, with the numbers UCLA has against the run on the defensive side. The question is, which team can withstand the deep shot down the field? I think Nebraska has a better shot at completing more deep shots. But if the UCLA DBs can play the ball like they did against Braden Shager against Hawaii in week one, if they can finally read a play like they did against Ethan Kaliak Manis in Rutgers the game a couple of weeks ago and make a play on the football like Brian Addison did, after realizing, hey, they're running the quarter pattern for the fifth straight time in a third and long, second and long, why don't we jump the route? He did it. Can they make those adjustments, get a couple of sacks, not get out muscled from the D-line to the O-line? I think UCLA can force some turnovers defensively. But if Garbers gives the ball back again and again, like more than – if Garbers turns this ball over in this game twice, I don't see a recipe for a UCLA victory on the road in Lincoln unless they're forcing Rayola into three or more turnovers, which would be possible because he's done it already. But that was against Indiana, who is a very good team that we've seen so far. Okay? So it's really going to be determined by UCLA secondary – withstanding some deep throws, multiple chances I think Nebraska will take in this game. Now, if they want to run the ball twice and set themselves up for a third and six, third and five, it's about one of the worst defenses getting off the field on third down more than 45%, more than 50%. Because against Rutgers, Rutgers did not do that against the Bruins, and UCLA capitalized by running out to a bigger lead. And they got off the field. That's why UCLA played well against Minnesota. Minnesota got behind the sticks early. The Bruins got off the field, shut them out for the first half. 
and they got a couple of stops, but they didn't get the stops when they needed it to win that game. If you look at the games when UCLA has played well, they have gotten stops on third down. Maybe not consistently, but they went on a string where they got a stop. Or maybe a team got over-aggressive like LSU and went for it fourth down and turned the ball over on downs near midfield just because Brian Kelly wanted to. I'm not sure Nebraska has that same philosophy and really needs to do that to beat the Bruins. But UCLA should be aggressive and push the ante and force this young quarterback into mistakes. How can Ikaika Malloy disguise a defense and not get burned by, by what we know is a D-line that has not gotten home more often than not this year? They have linebackers that can make plays. Carson Swessinger has been a savior for the Bruins defensively, just like Kay Madrano burst on this scene last year. Now, can the DBs make some plays? And will Garbers, he doesn't need to throw it as deep and make the deep shots like Rayola, but he has to have a big game. It doesn't need to be 50-yard completions to J. Michael Sturdivant, but sure, a big bomb to that. Or if Rico Flores is back, a couple of shots to him wouldn't hurt. But a nice 300-yard day against a good Nebraska defense wouldn't hurt. Now, I would take 275 and two touchdowns and no turnovers. That would win this game for UCLA, I think. So he doesn't need to go yards per completion. It's how many completions are they moving the chains? And he's protected. Is he protecting the football? And is he getting protected? While the Bruins, they can get to third and 10, third and 10, but they're not getting off the field. That will probably spell disaster like it's been the other five times they've lost this year where they couldn't get off the field. Teams complete it. They protect their quarterback and it's pitch and catch. It's that simple. Quarterback versus quarterback. Who has the better game, the Wiley veteran that's waited for the opportunity or the true freshman trying to burst onto the steam? We'll find out. Speaking about youngsters trying to burst on the scene, UCLA women's basketball had one of the top recruits in this next class come visit. What does that mean? We'll talk about it next on Locked on UCLA. Our friends over at 5-Hour Energy know that being a passionate football fan isn't just a hobby. It's a way of life. It takes a lot of energy to power through all-day tailgates, touchdown celebrations, or an agonizing second overtime, which is why they've created the Stan the Fan 5-Hour Energy Shot, which is a special flavor called Fan Fuel, the energy shot made just for super fans just like us, the fans who are first in line in the parking lot and who are the last to leave we see you. And you know what gave me a bit of this fan fuel? Of course, it may not be UCLA football related, but the Dodgers. We're all Dodgers fans. We're all going crazy. The city of LA is going to party. We have the super fan fuel. And if you're not a Dodgers fan, you got to believe, man, because that was a crazy, wicked game five of the World Series. So I'm going to sh share the love right now. Go Dodgers. They gave me when they're down 5 nothing. They come back. They tie the game. They're down again. They win the game. Epicness. That gives the city of Los Angeles and Dodger fans everywhere. And you know who's at the helm? A Bruin, Dave Roberts, who deserves some respect. That's the fan fuel. We're Bruins for life. Not that other school for a few seconds. All right? Five Hour Energy knows that no matter what team you root for, being a fan requires heart, soul, and a lot of energy. Whether you're prepping for the big tailgate or ironing your jersey, your game day to-do list is always a mile long. That's why the limited edition Stand the Fan Five-hour energy shot is here to help keep you fueled throughout the season. What's your fan fuel this week? Whatever it is, do it with the five-hour energy. Available at fivehourenergy.com, shipped nationwide. Cruising on here in the final segment of Locked On UCLA, some Corey Close recruiting news for UCLA women's basketball. And you're wondering, all right, they're a top five team, UCLA has done a lot. Corey Close has probably won many recruiting battles in the portal. The top three recruits from the 22 recruiting class, two, three of the top five or ten, are on UCLA's team from two seasons ago. Lauren Betts completely transformed the program from a top 16 team to a top five team. And this team is deeper than it's been, bringing in some of the best players in the portal. You bring in Charlize Ledger-Walker, who single-handedly beat the Bruins twice in the Pac-12 tournament and in the regular season, leading her former Washington State squad to the NCAA tournament. This team this year is going to be electric, and I hope they beat just everybody in their path, whether it's South Carolina, that, that school across town. Well, this is an interesting recruiting battle in the class of 25. The one battle 
that Corey Close, and I'm not really, you know, I wasn't really in on it when it came to the Juju Watkins commit. But, you know, that's something UCLA did not get in Juju, completely changed Lindsey Gottlieb's program for USC, like a completely different team. And all of a sudden they're on the map and they're top five. All right. So if UCLA can get a player like Aliyah Chavez, who is the top player in the country from the state of Texas, a 5'9 point guard from Lubbock, Texas, who can shoot. This is the scouting report on Aliyah Chavez, who just visited UCLA. And I think the women's team just posted on their socials about her coming. Rated as the number one player in the class, according to the 24-7 Sports Director of Scouting, Women's Basketball, and Brandon Clay. A prolific yet efficient scoring option at the guard position. Play on the ball, off the ball. And it says maybe it needs to be a primary lead guard in college. I wonder what that means if she comes in next year. You got Kiki Rice for a year. I wonder if that hampers the recruitment. But still, she can get her shot easily off as any high school guard he can remember. Dating back to the days of Kelsey Mitchell, according to Brandon Clay. Has a legitimate shooting range up to 25 feet and has the ability to get to the teeth of defense, quote-unquote, from Brandon Clay's written report on a consistent basis. Can hit the shot, can get to the bucket, and has been getting hoops apparently all this time for USA Basketball 3-on-3 three three in various, various opportunities. Now, this is what on three had to say or what she had to say to on three was that, you know, she posted about her official visit to UCLA. The Bruins are one of the five finalists battling with Texas and Texas tech. So her hometown team in Texas tech, which is if they get her completely changes the program, Texas, which has got that sec money, South Carolina, who's been winning a lot of battles to get all these players and Oklahoma. So a lot of schools over there. So you got three schools around the area, right? The Texas, Oklahoma, Texas tech, you've got South Carolina, and then UCLA, who's battling for her services, Juju Watkins, it, it just wouldn't be a fit, I think, because that's two on-ball guards. I think what UCLA and Corey Close has to convince this youngster who just came out to Westwood is that, hey, that's the only West Coast school she's recruiting. She said, I think, to on three, I've never been to California, so I want to take a visit there for sure. I like the way they played. They've not showed down. They're recruiting me well. That's what she said to the on three site during the summer. Now, she's been going on those official visits locally. Now, is that just a ploy to go out west and see everything? I hope not. But this is an elite star that could add to the depth UCLA has built from this year to next. I just wonder with what UCLA has with Kiki Rice and the guard spot, is it the fit? Is it just a year too soon? Or do the Bruins say, hey, we're going to pitch all the NIL bucks after you and try to convince you to come to this school? And Aliyah Chavez, right? So we'll see what happens. And this is what Goodman wrote in this Talia Goodman, not to confuse Jeff Goodman, Talia Goodman, in a quote to on three, front runners potentially Texas Tech and Texas, front runners, right, the Texas schools. Oklahoma can make a big push. But if Corey Close gets some NIL bucks, this is not what Goodman wrote. This is what Goodman wrote here. NIL will likely play a significant role in her decision. And I think I've seen things about what happened with previous steps in the recruiting. Not really going to dive into it, but that's an elite player visiting the program. And what Chavez said is, I don't want a coach that's low energy. All right? Quote, I'm telling you, Corey Close is not low energy. Not necessarily that those other coaches are low energy, but Close fits the bill. And if you want to be competitive and fight for a spot in the court, UCLA would be a good fit, and this would be a huge recruiting win for the Bruins. Huge. Although, even if the Bruins don't get it, they've been hitting the portal. They've been hitting and getting top-rated recruits. And the 22 class has a chance to be one of the all-time greatest UCLA classes with what they've combined with the portal of 22. That has been an elite steal for Corey Close, which could lead to a national championship. But if you look into the future, they could get Aliyah Chavez and get the best now for tomorrow. And speaking about tomorrow, we got keys to the game, prediction time. I locked on UCLA. I hope you stay safe and have a happy Halloween. You celebrate the Dodgers at the parade at home in Dodger Stadium, wherever. And let's go, Bruins. All right. So get your hands up for an eight clap. And one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. U C L A. U C L A. Fight, fight, fight. This has been locked on UCLA. Zach signing off. Go, Bruins.